Well, I thought a fun off would be to talk about some of the top coronavirus Google searches I've seen in this over the past couple of days. First of all, how is coronavirus spread? And we'll cover pretty much all on point today. Either I will or my colleagues in the nursing department will. Is the coronavirus deadly? Uh, depends on several factors. How do I know if coronavirus? Chances are you don't. What's the incubation period for coronavirus? I thought this was a very intelligent question. Incubate time between when you're first exposed to the pathogen and you start to see signs and symptoms. I'll talk about this briefly. It's about two to five days, which is pretty par for the course for most viruses. And is there a vaccine for a coronavirus? Short answer, no, not as of yet. And did the novel coronavirus come from snakes? I saw that one an inordinate number of times. Um, why people thought that. I think they, there was like snake meat for sale at some uh, common market or something like that, and they thought it jumped from snake people somehow. The likelihood of that being the case is extremely low. So anyway, so just some virus basics before we get started with some of the nitty gritty of the novel coronavirus. Viruses technically aren't true life forms for any one of a number of reasons. And since I see students in the audience, can any of them tell me one reason why they're not considered life forms in the classical traditional sense of life form? Oh, they're not made of a cell or cells, that's one reason. They don't have their own metabolism, strike two. Rhines of nucleic acid. Viruses either have DNA or an RNA core, excuse me. But they don't have both kinds of nucleic acids like life forms do. So viruses do exhibit some life form like qualis part. They're not considered life forms in the traditional sense of the word. They're all obligate intracellular parasites, meaning that in order to replicate, they have to get into a cell and kind of hijack that cell. Any other savvy people in the room? Science people? What about you IT people? Can anybody tell me what a computer virus is? You may know what it actually is. You probably have one on your phone or your computer at some point, but can anybody tell me what it actually is? It's a segment of code that takes control of the computer. Well, it's a segment, of, it's a program. It is an invasive program. Segment of code, I think that means you have to ask computer science people. I, I'm probably massacring the definition here, but yeah, it's, it's a program. It's a piece of code that gets into a computer and basically superimposes itself over the programs that the computer is running. So I've got my computer here running uh, PowerPoint and maintenance programs. If a virus were to get in there, it would impose itself over the programs being run and it would basically say, look, you're going to run me programs because I said so and you don't have a choice in the matter. So that's why the computer crashes or it does something else you don't want the computer to do because it's running a code that error. So a virus has to get inside a host cell, or at least itself inside the host cell, and hijack the programs. The computer will then make copies of that program. It'll travel to other computers and spread itself that way. Biological viruses work in a very, very similar manner. What happens is, I'll just show you this picture, a virus gets itself into a host cell, and essentially this host cell to make more virus parts, which all kind of self-assemble into new viruses, which then spread onto another cell. And viruses are very picky about the host cells and the host species they infect. So it's rare to find a virus that can cause full-fledged disease in multiple different species. I mean, there, there are examples. I mean, influenza can actually cause disease in several different species. Ray example. Coronavirus, not so much. We can find coronaviruses in other species, in other types of animals, but these specific to that species. Even though the coronaviruses have quite a few similarities, they're even picky about organisms they infect, the species they infect, but the cells that they're infecting. So they're not going to affect any human body. Typically, they'll go for the cells that make up the upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract to a lesser extent. So what is a host to do? What's a host cell going to do? So if you're invaded with a virus, this host, this cell on the left, pretty well screwed. So what is this going to do to take what you're, the cells in your body are all vegetarian. They're all very selfless. If this cell is screwed, it knows it's screwed. So it's going to do a few things to take one for that it makes its exit from the world. One thing it's going to do is send certain chemicals to this other cell called interferon, to put it simply. What the interferon does is it basically tells this cell to make some proteins to protect your cell. This is why something like coronavirus wouldn't completely sweep through your body, affecting the cells. Also, this cell will essentially rat itself out to the immune system. Normally, the immune system would not have a problem with this cell. But when it's infected, this cell can essentially tell the immune, I know I'm self, normally you'd be fine with me, but I have virus stuff in me, so you need to kill me. So it essentially commits suicide. 
Diseases like coronavirus, you can sometimes become susceptible also to what are called secondary infections. So when we start talking about fatality rate with some of these coronaviruses, it's not just a function of how well the virus can damage cells in the, all by itself. Other pathogens can sometimes come in and take advantage of what coronavirus, the primary infection, has done to your body. So fatality rates you see might be people who died of some other infection that came into the lung tissue, took all damage or the tissue damage, and found an appropriate home where they wouldn't have otherwise. Okay? Specifics. Coronaviruses are enveloped. So the vi basic virus, you've got a nucleic acid core. That's the money part of the virus. That's the part of the virus that actually gets on the host cell. That nucleic acid core, RNA core, has a protein shell called a capsid around. Outside of that protein shell, there might be an envelope. Coronaviruses have an envelope. In fact, that's kind of how they got their name. They have this kind of envelope with these spike proteins in them. And if you look at it on microscopes, they look like little stars. So they call them corona, like a sun, a coronavirus. And they have fairly large of the RNA viruses. They have probably the most DNA or close to the most DNA of any of the RNA viruses that can infect humans. And they do have, like I said, that envelope that makes them kind of look like little stars. Again, there are many different coronaviruses, many of which can cause disease in domesticated animals. In fact, some of the first coronaviruses for those animals, although there were, as we learned a little bit later, some coronaviruses could infect humans that were sequentially and structurally very similar to these early coronaviruses we discovered. Outside of uh, living, probably stay viable for about a week or more, which is somewhat unusual. Some viruses are much less hardy outside of the human for a week or so, well, up to a week, two to five days, living host cells and tissues. Okay. Now some HCOVs, human coronaviruses, one of the first ones we discovered that could cause serious disease in people was SARS. And this came about, about 2002, 2000. Interesting thing about SARS was they discovered the disease before they discovered the causative agent. I don't know if, I mean, do you remember this? When they first discovered SARS, they discovered the disease, and there was this mad dash to try to find out what pathogen. The papers flying out of China fast and furious. Some said it was a fungus. Some said it was a bacterium. Some said it was a virus. Eventually, they identified this coronavirus that caused this disease. So in the meantime, a lot of people got sick with this disease. 774-ish deaths, 9.56% per 10 fatality rate. Again, I think part of the reason for that was it took us a while to discover the agent. But now, when had outbreaks in places like China, we know that, well, this looks kind of like a coronavirus. Let's look to see if we can find coronaviruses in these patients. That's exactly what happened with this most recent uh, novel outbreak. They saw this outbreak and they identified a pathogen that we knew about, so they started looking for things that were very similar to coronaviruses, and sure enough, novel coronavirus. So again, part of the time that these viruses were killing people was us trying to identify the path. And by the time 2004 or so rolled, out, rolled around, this disease had pretty much run its course. Then we came across, and this one's actually, so you can still find cases of now, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Started in the Middle East. They found that camels can actually serve as intermediate hosts. Now the camels might not necessarily get the same disease, but they have the virus. And again, the more viruses you have on the planet, the greater the potential is for something like mutation and the greater the potential to spread to humans too. I think they found sets could harvest, or could harbor SARS virus, which was interesting. So again, we had more cases, fewer deaths, I'm sorry, more, greater fatality rate, fewer cases for deaths, but again, there are so many things that play into these fatality rates too. I mean, it's a matter of how lethal the virus is. It's also a, a function of, you know, how, what kind of these people have access to, you know, like that. So it, it, it's not just a, a function of the virus itself. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And a lot of people don't realize this either, that I'd say a good 15, 20% of what we call acute coryza or common colds are actually coronaviruses. So there are several out there that you may have had. They're very really common. They wrote it off as a simple common cold. So that's something to remember when people start getting panicked about whether they're going to get coronavirus. Chances are the United States with, advance, with our advances in, in health care and such, the likelihood of you being pretty low. And even if you are, the likelihood of seeing the fatality rate this here is, is pretty unlikely. And I think the fatality rate is about 2% or so right now, novel coronavirus. And that's just, you see, I think you saw, this was on the internet, wasn't it? This is just a basic picture of a coronavirus. 
it's got an envelope, it's got a protein shell, and it's got all sorts of spike in it. And they use these spike proteins to attach to their, their favorite host cells of choice. Now, as far as this novel coronavirus goes, this is creation for it. They're, they're going to come up with another name for this soon. I don't know who does this or how they do it, but they call it right now, the official designation is NCOV, novel coronavirus. Like Middle East Respiratory Center, it'll get a, a name soon, but since this is such a relatively recent discovery, a few months ago, I mean, they discovered this right at the end of 2019, like December 31st. I think they finally nailed down what pathogen was causing this. We will get a more technical sounding name in the near future. Now, they first saw this ammonia outbreak in Wuhan City, and again, given that this was in China, they thought, will in common viruses we find in these areas, like influenza, coronaviruses, see if we find something that looks similar. And sure. Genetically, structurally, this is most similar to the virus that caused SARS. So again, genetic structural similarity led them to believe, okay, we're dealing with something that's very similar to the severe acute we had back in 2002 and 2003. A number of articles I saw related to this said bats can serve as intermediate hosts, meaning that bats can harbor the virus. They might not necessarily get the same disease, but the virus, the virus can multiply in their cells and potentially spread to other bats and to other people, well, to, to people. Incubation period, like I said, time it takes between exposure and showing signs and symptoms is about two to five days. And I just read this. As of this morning, there were, I just saw this went over 8,000 right before lunch, so. CNN was reporting that we're over 8,000 cases, 171 deaths, I think. And again, there are a few antivirals and monoclonal antibodies that show promise for treatment. But for the most part, I, most people, the epicenter of this outbreak, are just kind of, if they're getting exposed to the virus and getting sick, just kind of having to let it run its course. They're working on vaccine, but you know, I, I, that's still probably a month off or several months. And again, I found this, this is as you've got January 30th on here. This is the number of cases of coronavirus we've seen, and this doesn't really show up well, I realize. You can't probably see that, but they're finding a lot of these cases of the disease, so. And I put this on here, too. I'm, I'm not condoning you not take this outbreak seriously. Certainly not condoning being a Packer fan, because that's, that's a disease state in and of itself, but whenever outbreak stories hit the press, I think a lot of people get really frightened, and it's a good thing to be aware of, and I think you're going to talk a little bit more about this. In fact, the blog post you did, how important it is to relay to cremation to people and not to necessarily panic. So this is something we need to be a thing that's important to follow, but it's not the sort of thing we need to panic about. Again, my colleague nursing department here will talk more about how the disease is spread and what you can do, more perspective, but. Okay, well then I'll pass this off to Nancy. Thank you, thanks Jim. Ah, drive two. Well, hi everybody. Um, no, no, every room. My name is uh, Nancy Ryland and I teach in the uh, College of Nurses and my specialty is community and public health nursing. So I'm excited about that because disease is spreading and not that I'm worried about it from being here in this. I'm excited about it because I'm an epidemiology geek. I just love following stories like this and learning about gaining more knowledge in the control of disease, whether it's here locally in Will County, in the U.S., and in this case, globally. Okay, so what we know and what we don't know. We, we heard a lot about the information that has come up last month, which is pretty amazing, and that's all due to work on a global um, regional and a global team with missions such as uh, the World Health Organization and even from the U.S. Centers for Control. So we know, um, and as you were told about, we're, we're looking at from past cases of similar viruses. So looking at how SARS developed and the transmission and how we were able to keep it, keep it uh, toned down a bit, uh, all the way to the MERS, which had a high um, or fatality rate. We're taking some of those lessons learned and to the coronavirus. So some of those might be assumptions at first to play out and be tested to see as far as there's still a little bit of uh, as to when people might be able to shed this virus, whether it's before they uh, in symptoms or after. So they're still looking at those possibilities. As far as we've learned somewhat about the transmission, where originally 
It was being transmitted um, through folks that had visited the market where there was a lot of livestock and uh, fish market, um, that it could be then tra transferred person to person. We haven't seen that in the U.S. cases, luckily. So that has kept our cases at five, at least as of this morning. Um, so that's, that's a good thing to know. Transmission. So what's going around this time of the year, just here? Old flu, a lot of upper respiratory infections. Okay, so we know that this spread in a similar way. And, and we also, there is some predictions that this is less contagious than things like the measles. So the measles, somebody can be in the room, they have active measles, they cough, they breathe. It's aerosolized, can, you could just be walking through that room and if you're not vaccinated or protected, you may get the ca a case of measles. It's less like um, they're looking at maybe a three to six foot contact area, so we would call that a close contact, um, that you would be with them and they'd be actively coughing. So coughing up secretions, you may not be able to see those, they're in the air, less likely they're gonna spread way out to folks that you come casually in contact with. Okay, so we talked a little bit. I had to pull out my map because when I heard Wuhan, China, I had no idea where that was. Um, so we're looking at, this is the center uh, or where the infections are being found. Um, just for perspective, this is Hong Kong, a little bit more familiar with uh, Hong Kong as far as the um, intense uh, population in Hong Kong and the number of people that live there. So luckily, because Hong Kong is considered not mainland China, there's opportunities for that strict travel to Hong Kong, which has uh, been put into place, and that has really helped with not bringing this to a place where it could potentially spread liquor. So all the cases right now have, uh, well, I want to say almost case they're, they're looking at, maybe not, um, not really in China. Um, pretty much all the cases have been sized in uh, Wuhan with some then a uh, really travel to that area. So people had been in that part of China, went back to their home country or went to visit someplace else and developed there. So they're all what's considered travel related. The others, um, so is that the kind of ground zero where this started, was this market where whether it was cats um, being able to infect other livestock or products that were being, uh, uh, was those folks that, that uh, got sick, went back. Uh, the second round was uh, health of those people that got sick enough to go into the hospital before it was identified, it was they were transmitting it to healthcare workers. So that was the next ring that started to be exposed. So screening, what are we doing right now? Anybody traveled in the last couple weeks, seen anything different at airports? Probably you're not gonna see different unless you're coming through an international terminal, but we have um, a lot of technology to look at body temperature. So whether it's a good old fashioned thermometer, temporal thermometer, just waving it across your head, or there's actually devices as people walk through, it gives a profile of their, their body temperatures and it would identify who might have a fever. Well, fever is not a number one symptom for coronavirus, so we can't people's temperature. We have to look at coughing and other upper, upper respiratory. And I'm sure if you've been on a plane, you know there are a number of people that get on at any given because of allergies or they have a a norm, common cold uh, that are going to be coughing and sneezing. So um, there's a lot of whether these are cases of this novel coronavirus or something that is circulating uh, routinely. So how we diagnose. Do diagnostic screen for this novel coronavirus specimen, so that would be a respiratory specimen or what you cough up, um, would have to go the U.S. go to the CDC for confirmation. In China, the World Health and in their um, CDC-like programs are on the spot testing. So it's not just symptoms; it's actually um, a sputum or a blood test to whether this is the novel coronavirus. Treatment: What do we do when we have a cold or an upper respiratory infection? Chicken soup, get some sleep, uh, stay home especially if you have a fever and in your illness when you really have, or you have that um, productive cough, 
Okay, so those are the types of things initially if you would have curse you would do. It would be more so important if you had those symptoms within the region of China where coronavirus is going on to get yourself tested. Not that that means your depression is going to be worse. It's just for identification, identification of cases and to then further kind of quarantine you're not spreading that infection. There is, and I think what's uh, interesting about the, of all this happening, that um, there is a lot of research already being done, things like the use of some HIV drugs to potentially be like an antiviral given to people at risk or early on in the disease. Um, so it's um, some good coming from situation in that there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of new information out of this. Okay, so we just want to talk about, because if we're trying to feel a little more comfortable, that which from the CDC, our general risk within the U.S. is low. Um, but we want to be aware of what's in there, because of how we get our information. Sometimes we don't dig down deep, like, what does that really mean? Oh, yes, we have this illnesses. Does that mean it's coronavirus from China? We are in the height of our flu season. So according to the CDC is high. We have an uh, uptick in H1N1 uh, influenza. So that's, uh, especially for our, our young, young adults, that's one of that virus that was around six, seven or eight years ago when we got into our regular flu vaccine. And that was really impacting a lot of young, healthy people. The same uh, cousin of the influenza that was here in 1918, which none of us we're here that killed um, millions of people. So cold versus flu. Anybody, how, how can you possibly differentiate, like this isn't a cold, this is a flu. Flu what? Fever, <laughs> right? So usually you get a, a more um, with a flu, generally more headaches, more body aches versus a cold, it's generally more the race of sneezing, congestion, runny nose, cough, sore throat. Um, if you've had a flu, you'll know it. It knocks you off your feet. It's one of those where it's not a question of whether or not I should go to work. It's said. So um, good thing about having, we do have protection against the strains that we see coming and that we anticipate to be the worst with our flu shots. So that is why we believe because the, those mutations occur or those changes in the strain. Um, even if, so flu shots aren't 100%, but it, there's uh, research that if you do have your flu shot exposed and you get infected, your course of the flu is going to be uh, generally. Okay, so that's influenza. Um, so uh, H1N1, and then there's a strain of influenza B that we have mutated a little bit from what our flu shot um, protected against, and that's being found especially with uh, kids. We've um, had an increase in uh, childhood fatalities related to flu this season. Um, but then again, like to look in related to coronavirus and our concerns, I think we've had 7,000 from the flu in the U.S. this year versus, so if we're looking at the number of deaths from something we should all try to be protected against, um, versus how many cases of the coronavirus just in one, one area. Um, I put this up here, Legionnaires. Have you seen anything about Legionnaires locally in the news? Maybe, maybe not, but um, just wanted to spell rumors that is told in coronavirus. It is bacteria, and it is really generally related to either uh, ventilation or water systems. So uh, could be bad guys on that, uh, fountains, um, water, just water systems within Institute. So in Will County, we've had four cases of Legionnaires that I've heard of, uh, two at a Bolingbrook nurse, two at a Plainfield nursing home. So again, those are not transmitted person to person. So those are isolated and related to that facility that those folks are at. So just for you there. Okay, so my, my friend Mary Beth is going to talk about how we continue to be healthy. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I get to talk to you about how to stay healthy. I teach population health and the 
graduate nursing program, population health is all about prevention. So first thing is um, get your annual flu shot. Eat and sleep well. Doesn't that sound good, all of you that are studying so hard? Maybe have tests and a lot of homework. Get to sleep. Uh, stay hydrated. The hand washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Now, when I'm teaching, one of the ways we teach uh, nursing students and children, maybe some of you are familiar with this, you can um, sing Happy Birthday your hands you can sing happy birthday and if you do it slowly you'll be at the 20 seconds if you don't feel like counting up to 20 but that was um, if you don't have the near the soap and water have your hand sign sanitizer with you cover your cough so daily have like a tissue to cover your cough and then of course always wash your hands after you and monitor yourself for any symptoms okay um, and you, obviously you want to avoid getting your classmates, friends sick. Uh, you want to stay if you're sick, especially if you have a fever. Um, you would contact the health profession, high risk category. Say you have another, um, maybe diabetes, or if you have any other kind of health issue and put you at risk. Um, certainly if you have trouble breathing, a high fever or symptoms that aren't going away or that are getting worse. So you just want to take really good care of yourself. Okay. Any questions on this? When you say aren't going away, is that after a sort of week? What time period should I give myself to consider whether something is going away or not? Well, that's a really good question. First of all, you have to self, right? And if you just know you are just feeling really bad, I would advise you to call your care provider, honestly. That's always the first thing to do. But um, certainly if you're having a fever, you should, I would be calling your health, but you want to stay hydrated. And certainly if you're short of breath, that needs immediate attention. If suddenly you're just having trouble breathing, that would be a urgent situation especially if maybe you have asthma and your breathing is getting a more difficult, I would definitely be uh, reporting. That. So if it, you're just feeling a little flu-like where maybe you're just tired and uh, but if you're starting to get a fever, you would want to um, call on that. So does that answer your question? And certainly Nancy had mentioned if you are feeling better and then suddenly you get really bad again I would you it always uh, help somebody and then if you were preventative you would have had that which really helps and so that is I gave you a handout from the CDC and uh, it currently identifies the risk for spreading of um, uh, novel uh, coronavirus and this is low there's five cases has been reported in the US. If you want current statistics, go to the CDC web, very reliable. Any travel to or interaction with anyone that's traveled to Wuhan, China, increases your, okay? And there are many viruses and bacteria that cause respiratory infections. So most at risk are people that are the uh, ch children, very young, elderly, or if you are uh, immuno, um, you know, you're compromised in any other way. And then you'd want to protect yourself, everyday healthy habits, like we talked about, uh, the hand washing and covering your mouth if you're calm, if you're sick, and um, that will help decrease your risk and spread of infection. And then we have to think about the people that have been impacted. There's over 60 plus people in China that have died. And so all of those people, the needs of their family um, and what they're all going through because of this sudden onset. And there's over 5,000 people globally that have been, uh, are sick from this. To so, um, always remember and, and pray for all of these families that have died and lost family members. We may have faculty here that have relatives uh, that they, they know personally from this area. So 
We also need to pray for the health uh, personnel in that area. It must be, as much as they're trying to be controlled, it must be causing high anxiety and stress there. So uh, all of the public health personnel, the nurses, all the care providers and families, um, and even all the researchers and the policymakers and organizations that are trying to um, deal with this situation. And uh, I know we're going to have a lot more and hopefully uh, find a way to treat this in the future. We're going to be learning a lot from them. And so, um, so thank you. So hi, everybody. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Ryan at the business school here. And we have to think about what kind of impact does it have on business? So how many of you think it has an impact on you in, in a terms of business world? Great, none of you. It actually does. When you think about it, the stock market, which we all know is like investments and securities, in the last five days, it's dropped a thousand, a thousand points. So the valuation of the Dow Jones Industrials dropped 30, of the 30 largest companies have dropped a thousand dollars. And this is after a great bull run of the last several. And why is it dropping? It's because investors and globalists are worried about how long this virus will last and what will be the impact. And what kind of impact are we thinking? Well, we already saw that travel curtailed. And what do we have here in Chicago? We have the Hyatt Corporation, headquartered. They have major hotels in mainland China. Those are being impacted by travelers. Uh, the Marriott Corporation, Marriott Hotels, 10% of their hotels are in China. So it impacted Delta, United, and American Airlines have all cut uh, their flights to China and their stock down. So if you own stocks in those companies, you've gone down. How many of you have a smartphone? Should raise hands, hopefully all of you. So if you're looking to buy a smartphone in the next couple of weeks, it may not, uh, the market will get a little dried up because they're not producers are being shut down because China's the consumer of raw materials in the world and Freeport McMoran, which is the largest industrial uh, mining company, their largest client, China, is not buying raw materials shut. So how does that impact you here in Roville? I can tell you if you drive to campus, and a lot of you do, you drive by uh, huge warehouses. We're the supply chain capital. So when something's being built in China and then it's being shipped over by boat, which is a week to the west of Long Beach, uh, and then it gets uh, on a train to be brought here to Romeoville, then delivered on a truck, then goes to Amazon, which as you, if you're in your, your home and you're buying something, so you're going to learn about supply and demand. The supply that we have is going to be uh, essentially, the demand will just stay there, which means higher prices. Uh, even Starbucks, uh, if you've had your coffee today, of the 4,300 stores that they have, over half are closed, right? So that means over half are closed, which means they're, uh, you know, people aren't making money. In Romeoville, when you're a truck driver, truck drivers get paid by the mile usually. So if there's not um, items, commodities, from one area to another, they're not making money. Delivery drivers for Amazon's not making money. And the people that work at headquarters at Hyatt, there's much money because people aren't buying hotel rooms. And the people at United, so it does have all of us here uh, in, in Romeoville and also in just the business world. What should I do? Should I be worried? Should I pull my money out? Because for those that have investments, and you're like, oh my gosh, Ryan just said a 1,000 points dropped in the last five days and my stock portfolio, my retirement went down. You would, would, would sell all your stocks. None of you could. So this is a time to buy because it's a lower uh, deep. And the thing for businesses, it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal uh, for the last three days, this uh, coronavirus. Why, is, why are we concerned about it? Because we can't predict from business when this will end. And once it ends, it takes time to ramp things up, right? The longer this goes and we don't have a deadline, the, the more the markets will get depressed. Uh, the letter shaky investors will get out. But I would say stay the course. Everybody's young in this room. And if you're not investing, start investing. It's a good time to buy. So, but there's, and but this does have an impact here in Romeoville. So, thank you. I'm going to ask a question, and I don't know who from the panel should answer it. Um, saw the video about China significantly affecting travel, factories are being shut down. Yet we all hear that this isn't something that we should panic about. So uh, what is it that they're afraid of? What is it that they're afraid might happen to do all these things? Yeah, I, you have to stand up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, if I was to hazard a guess, I think, you know, like I said, when people hear outbreak stories, it doesn't matter where they are around the world. I think part of the reason why they're doing a lot of what they're doing is not only to protect their own citizens, but to all give the world the impression that they're taking it seriously. 
So as long as taking these steps to curtail the spread of the virus, we'll feel a little more at ease that the problem is as under control as it possibly can. And like Dr. Butt said, we're not going to like start dumping our stock portfolios or anything crazy like that. And the outcome is that this isn't going to be as serious as people are, are fearing it's going to be. So I guess that's just my opinion. And just to tag on to that idea, anytime we don't want something to spread, especially when we don't have a vaccine or medicine to treat or prevent it, the best way is to not give it another host to jump to incubate in that person and then spread it to another. So the idea of isolating people in close proximity to each other is just a way to help it to kind of just like SARS had done. And she brings up an interesting point too, because when you think about pathogens that come from China, you've got a very dense population there and you've got a lot of pathogen influenza that can grow in both human cells and cells in other animals. I mean, the pork and fowl are an uh, integral part of the diet. So those can all influenza viruses, for example, and allow them to incubate and grow and divide. So again, I, I think the Chinese have more experience with this sort of thing than a lot of people tend to give them credit for. So at least from an investor, I'm, I'm not that worried. Could we the the faculty members who took time to prepare for this session? And I want to thank all the people who came uh, and took time out of your days to be here with us. So enjoy the rest of your day.